Mr. Sullivan holds both a BA and an MPA from Indiana University. Mr. Dyke Weatherington is the Deputy Director for Unmanned Warfare and Portfolio Systems Acquisition in the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, Logistics, and the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. He must have quite the business card. A retired Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force, he is responsible for acquisition oversight for unmanned aircraft systems and associated subsystems. He is also the functional lead for the De Deputy Secretary of Defense directed UAS Task Force. He holds a BS from the United States Air Force Academy and an MA from California State University. And the Honorable Kevin Wolf serves as the Assistant Secretary for Export Administration at the United States Department of Commerce. Prior to this, he was a partner at Bryan Cave LLP, where he worked on export administration regulations, international traffic and arms regulations, and sanctions administered by the Office of Foreign Assets Control. He holds a BA from the University of Missouri and an MA and JD from the University of Minnesota. Thank you again, all of you, for being here and sharing your substantial expertise with us. It's our policy to swear in the witnesses, so if you would please arise and raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, I remind uh, you of what I think you already know, that all of your written testimony will be placed on the record in its entirety. And uh, we would just ask you if you could summarize that in about five minutes each. And we'll do some question and answering after that. And uh, thank you. We'll start with you, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Flake. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to discuss GAO's report on the Department's unmanned aircraft systems acquisition efforts from J July of last year. My statement today focuses on acquisition outcomes, the extent of collaboration among the services in those acquisitions, and recent investment decisions related to unmanned aircraft acquisitions. As has been stated earlier in, uh, in the hearing, from 2002 to 2008, the number of unmanned aircraft in DOD's inventory has grown from about 167 to more than 7,000 as a result of growing demand from the field. Once fielded, these aircraft have proven to be quite valuable to our warfighters. However, there have been growing pains along the way. We assessed the 10 largest unmanned aircraft programs, eight air systems and two payload systems for the report that we did in last July and found that their development costs had grown by $3 billion, or 37 percent on average. Procurement funding has increased for most of those programs, but this is mostly due to increases in the number of aircraft being procured, which is a good thing. Nonetheless, procurement unit costs have grown by 12 percent on average. Our assessment found varying degrees of collaboration among the services, for example, the Marine Corps was able to avoid the cost of initial system development and, and a lot of duplication of capabilities and was also able, able to deliver needed capability to its Marines very quickly by simply choosing to procure existing shadow aircraft from the existing Army program. In another case, the Navy is expecting to save time and money on its broad area mar maritime surveillance system by using the existing Air Force Global Hawk airframe. However, it's developing a lot of its own unique subsystems rather than uh, joining the Air Force in some of those procurements. In contrast to those examples, the Army and the Air Force did not effectively collaborate on their Predator and Sky Warrior programs, despite strong direction from the department to do so. Uh, there's no real, we don't really have any estimates of the cost that that might have, uh, that might have occurred because of the du duplicative efforts there, but we do know that the Army had to stand up a program office and had a development effort of over a half a billion dollars. So that probably is some cost that they didn't need. Much greater commonality could have been achieved uh, as each of those uh, weapon systems are being developed by the same contractor. One is a variant of the other. Service-centric requirements and an unwillingness to collaborate were key factors in limiting commonality across these programs. Despite the department's efforts to emphasize jointness and encourage commonality, the services continued to establish unique requirements, some of which have raised concerns about unnecessary duplication, such as the Sky Warrior uh, and the Predator. 
Since our report was issued, the department has made an investment decision to increase development of unmanned aircraft and procure larger numbers, which we think is a good thing. It, rec it also recognizes that, that this important investment must be leveraged effectively. One of the major goals of the UAS roadmap is to foster the development and practice of policies, standards, and procedures for operating unmanned aircraft and to promote the enforcement of government, international, and commercial standards for the design, manufacture, testing, and operation of unmanned systems. The roadmap has recognized the potential for unprecedented levels of collaboration to gain capabilities at reduced acquisition costs. And we have reported in the past that one key to increased collaboration and commonality is the use of open systems across product lines, across airframes, subsystems, and even down to the component level. Unmanned systems are critical to the department's mission and will continue to grow in numbers and in effectiveness. In order to acquire them most efficiently in today's environment of constrained resources, the department should follow through on its stated goals and continue to force joint standardized weapon systems wherever it makes sense. Mr. Chairman, that completes my statement. Thank you very much. We appreciate your statement. Mr. Weatherington. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Congressman Flake, um, thank you for the opportunity to appear today before you to discuss the Department of Defense's Unmanned Aircraft Systems Acquisition Programs specifically department initiatives to achieve greater commonality and efficiencies. My testimony will address a full spectrum of DOD UAS systems. This distinction is important because we have pursued opportunities for commonality and efficiency successfully across the full range of DOD unmanned aircraft systems, including small unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, table one in, in uh, the provided testimony is included to identify the broad diversity of unmanned aircraft systems supporting a broad range of warfighter needs and you have examples of each of the groups of uh, those systems on the table uh, in front of you. Uh, the GAO report, defense acquisitions, opportunities that exist to achieve greater commonality and efficiency among aircraft systems was released last July uh, and reviewed the DOD UAS program group three through five. GEO had five recommendations. The department partially concurred with the recommendation to conduct a rigorous, comprehensive analysis of requirements for current UAS and to develop a strategy for making systems and subsystems among these programs more common. At the time of the review, the UAS task force, with support from the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, had already completed a comprehensive analysis of the potential for commonality between the current Air Force Predator program and the Army's Extended Range Multipurpose Program. Since the report was released, the UAS Task Force, in coordination with Joint Staff, has conducted a rigorous review of the Navy's BAMS program uh, and the Air Force Global Hawk program to evaluate opportunities for achieving greater commonality and joint efficiencies. We have completed that analysis along with one addressing signals intelligence or SIGINT payload commonality. Uh, the Department will uh, concurred with the remaining four GAO recommendations in that report. Since the GAO has released its report, the Department has completed its 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review and the President has submitted his fiscal year 2011 budget. The QDR highlights the continuing warfighter need for increased intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance and force protection capabilities provided by unmanned aircraft system and the budget reflects the Department's in increased investment needs in these areas. This investment is consistent with the acquisition reform goal in DOD's high priority performance goals presented in the analytical perspective volumes of the President's FY11 budget. The Department's investment in operation in UAS continues to increase as demand for a wide range of UAS capabilities expands as was discussed in the first panel. DOD's annual budget for development and procurement of UAS has increased from about $1.7 billion in fiscal year 2006 to over $4.2 billion in fiscal year 2010. During that same period, DOD U.S. operations have grown from about 165,000 hours to over 550,000 hours annually, and there's a graphic in the testimony. Unmanned aircraft system inventory has increased from less than 3,000 to over 6,500 aircraft, as been mentioned previously. 
The department is making significant investments in unmanned aircraft systems, and that is projected to grow significantly over the next five years, achieving commonality, interoperability, and joint efficiencies in development, production, and operation and support is critical to controlling costs and delivering interoperable, reliable systems to the warfighter with capabilities they need to win. We will continue to improve the defense acquisition system and have formed the UAS task force jointly to address critical UAS technology and acquisition issues to enhance operation, enable interdependencies, commonalities, and other efficiencies. Just a quick update on our current DOD UAS programs. Uh, this year, the department made the commitment to grow Air Force Predator and Reaper Combat Air Patrols, or CAPS, to 50 by 2011. And the Air Force is on track to achieve this goal and will continue to expand the force structure to support up to 65 CAPS by FY13. The Army is also expanding many classes of UAS, including accelerated production of the Predator class ERMP and also upgrading Shadow. In addition to the quick reaction capability of eight ERMP aircraft already fielded on Iraq, the Army will field a second quick reaction capability to Afghanistan this year. The Army also plans to field 13 ERMP systems of 12 air aircraft each to each of the combat aviation brigades starting in FY11. Navy is an engineering and manufacturing development phase for its BAMS UAS program and is introducing sea-based unmanned aircraft systems with its vertical takeoff, unmanned aerial vehicle, and its small tactical unmanned aircraft system. Navy plans to award the STUAS contract later this year. Finally, all the military departments and Special Operations Command are operating the hand-launched Raven with over 4,700 aircraft delivered to the warfighter. Closing, Mr. Chairman, the department is investing in UAS Investment in UAS is projected to continue to grow. We recognize achieving commonality, interoperability, and joint efficiencies in development, production, operations, and support is critical to controlling costs and delivering interoperable, reliable systems to the warfighters. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Wolf, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Tierney, Congressman Flake, members of the committee, professional staff. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify for your committee. Um, on the Department of Commerce's role in export controls of unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, related components, and technology. Uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security, BIS, uh, within the Department of Commerce administers the controls on the export, re-export, and in-country and transit of, of a range of dual-use items, commodities, software, technology that have both civilian and military uses. Uh, in doing so, BIS works closely with a number of departments and agencies, including the Departments of Defense, uh, State, Energy, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and its Bureau of Immigration of Customs Enforcement, and the Department of Justice. Uh, the dual-use export control system is an important tool to protect the national security of the United States against diverse threats that our, nations face, our nation faces. Uh, state and non-state actors seek to acquire weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them, as well as conventional arms and other items that could be used for terrorist purposes. Uh, BIS implements the dual-use uh, control system through the Export Administration regulations. Uh, under the EAR, uh, BIS regulates the export of certain UAVs and related items based on multilateral control lists and other items that could be used in or for UAVs through unilateral controls on end uses and end users. What I mean by that is that the, the dual-use regulations administered by the Bureau of Industry and Security are one part of a greater scheme. Uh, you have um, multilateral controls, principally the, multi, uh, the missile technology control regime, uh, sometimes called the MTCR and, and the Wassenaar arrangement, which are arrangements between, depending upon the regime, 34 to 40 plus uh, member countries, uh, which have agreed to establish lists of items uh, and technologies uh, that should be controlled for export and re-export out outside of the member countries. Um, and these lists that are agreed to and worked on and revised regularly by various committee, committees uh, by which the, the Commerce Department and other U.S. departments participate um, are updated to take into account current threats and current issues. Um, uh, these lists that the MTCR creates and the other multilateral regimes work, uh, are the basis for the list of items that the uh, U.S. government controls for export, re-export, or in-country transit. Um, uh, the, the, the Commerce Department regulations, the dual-use regulations, again, even within the domestic regime, are only one part of that. Uh, the other part uh, is uh, what are called the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, 
uh, which are the regulations administered and governed and implemented by the, uh, the State Department's Directorate of Defense Trade Controls. And principally what those regulations govern in terms of the export and re-export are, are defense articles such as UAVs uh, that are specifically designed or modified for military application uh, or parts or components for those UAVs that are specifically designed or modified um, uh, for military UAVs rather. Um, and all technical data and services that are directly related to the UAVs and to those parts and components. Now you know that if, from your own work on that. So why don't we see a better structure with more discipline uh, and somebody stand up to the different services and say, this can't go on? You know, and that's what I think your role at the DOD is. I'm not putting this on you. You're the, I understand you're the deputy director and is, the deputies get to do so much or whatever. But isn't somebody there thinking along those lines and saying, like, look, this just doesn't make sense. We haven't got an unlimited pocketbook here? Mr. Chairman, that's a very fair question, and, and I would articulate that the Department is doing a very good job of that. Again, in my written testimony, there are several examples of where, through OSD and Joint Staff Encouragement, we, we, we have gotten all the services to procure identical or virtually identical systems. Mr. Sullivan commented, on the Marine Corps decision to buy the Army Shadow System. Okay. They're buying that off well, an Army. Well, it sounds like it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Mr. Sullivan, what do you say to my question? Uh, well, I, I would agree with that. Uh, the, the, as we understand the position of the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, that is the position that should be making these decisions. Mm -hmm. And we don't See that each of the services is making the decision. We don't see that happening. The services, ten, and you know, we've, there's enough that you're getting into here that could be a whole different hearing. Well, I'm, I'm suspecting we might, but I mean, yeah. somebody's going to set priorities here, and somebody times yes. say no. You yes, know, and so maybe this one, this service's request isn't as important as somebody else's, and, and one has to be delayed a little bit, the other has to be expedited. Yes, that's I would think the referee's job here is the Department of Defense and that uh, acquisition group on that. So maybe and that and, is, and, uh, I, and certainly. That, think for another hearing someday. Right? Certainly, uh, Mr. Weatherington, like you stated, is, I mean, this, is, this isn't the only place that this happens. This yeah, is yeah, this is, look, this is not a blame game thing. Uh, you guys are all working as hard as you can, and, and we appreciate that. But I guess it's our job, sitting where we're sitting, to start helping people focus a little bit here and, and thinking of different ways to do it. Prioritization would be one thing on that. Putting some central management and discipline into it would be a, another way to go about it. Uh, and the other part that we haven't got into today, but will probably be part of any future hearing that we do on this, we continue right across all acquisitions uh, to see too few really qualified managers, uh, too few qualified schedulers, so that even when we try to have oversight, uh, we've just been hollowed out a little bit, and we, and we don't find that we have the resources there. We've talked about this with uh, the people in the in various aspects of that agency on that, and we're going to have to find out what the Department of Defense's plan is uh, to get people in. I know that it's competitive financially. Some people get a better job going off in the private sector and it's hard to entice people. So what's our plan to turn that around? What's our plan so that when we go to production with something, we have good schedulers who keep us online, good uh, product managers to keep us online, and, and somebody to say, no, we're not going to change this 15 times along the path here, uh, which helps escalate the cost all the way up. So uh, we probably will get into that uh, in a little bit more. But Mr. Flake, do you have any additional questions you want to ask on that? I do think that this is going to probably require us to talk a little bit about the subsistence and the commonality between those, the uniqueness, needs, and things of that nature. Uh, we want to talk with, with the idea of how do we not stifle innovation while we're doing that and all of those things at another point. Let me give each of you the opportunity to tell me what we should have asked you or should have explored here that we should bring up at the next meeting if, uh, if we can, Mr. Sullivan. Well, I, <clears throat> I think I just would say that it's an exciting area to be in. And we were just kind of going through all the the, uh, the problems with the acquisition process, and certainly this isn't immune to it, but what I see with uh, unmanned systems is an opportunity to really capitalize on standardization and plug and play kind of things. And, and I would also say that the roadmap that uh, Mr. Weatherington's office has published has goals in it that I think are goals and priorities that are pretty sound but somebody has to listen to them. And a lot of them drive towards commonality standardization as a way to reduce duplication and save money in the acquisition process. When would be an appropriate time, Mr. Sullivan, for us to ask GAO to take a look at the performance of the department in meeting those goals? Um, I mean, giving it, them time to get them up and running before we start you know, trying to be, critique them. But 
uh, that might be something. That, well, the, the latest roadmap was, when was that issued? Late last year. Maybe right, the, Mr. Weatherton, what, what do you think is a fair time for us to ask Mr. Sullivan's group to take a look and see how close you are adhering to that? Uh, sir, that's really on your timeline. Uh, well, we, it is, we, but I'm asking for a recommendation from you. I could ask for it tomorrow, and it would seem unfair <laughs> to you because you just passed the darn things. Yes, sir. Is that some? We can probably discuss that uh, with your staff and figure sure. out a way where. Right, we're but let's resourced. keep Mr. Weatherington in the loop here so that he doesn't yeah. feel like he's an unfair assessment on that. I, I want it to be constructive. Yes, sir. This yes. isn't about, as I said earlier, playing tag with people or anything like that. We want to be able to look at it a little bit out and then say it's working or it's not working. How are we doing on these things? Mr. Weatherington, anything else that we should add? No, sir. Okay. Mr. Wolf. Just one follow-up thought on your China question about exports from China, for example, and I forgot to mention that uh, there are various statutes uh, that uh, give the U.S. government the ability to impose sanctions against foreign companies uh, that are engaged in proliferation-related activities, which would include the export of UAVs and other MTCR-controlled items to Iran and other sanctioned countries. Uh, uh, those regulations, I mean, those statutes are largely administered by the, the State Department, but that is another avenue uh, uh, that the U.S. government has in terms of trying to affect and prevent the, uh, the flow of non-U.S. origin exports from uh, third countries. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me just leave you with this, though. Why don't combatant commands' uh, sense of war fighting requirements drive the procurement requirements since we do fight jointly rather than as individual services? Are you, do you, do combatant anybody, commands anybody? should have more say in what the requirements are for the weapon systems. I agree. Goldwater Nichols was a major piece of legislation passed a long time ago that was trying to matrix all that. And if, if you look at it, I think we did it very well on the operations side, but Not on the, on the acquisition side. side, it didn't take too well. Do your goals, Mr. Weatherington, sort of get us back in that direction at all, do you feel? Sir, actually, one of the goals specifically talked to meeting specific urgent warfighter requirements. And I would articulate that you, it is difficult to find any other technology in the Department of Defense that in a single decade has made, made such a tremendous impact on the warfighting capability of the department. That is not to say that we've done everything perfectly because in many cases we, we had to react very, very quickly. But I believe the process we have today with the formal acquisition process and the opportunity for warfighters to send in urgent warfighter requirements get equal weight in our acquisition process. Yeah, and this, as I say, these oversight hearings are about getting things perfect in the future, you know, more so than beating people up over the past. So the idea is how can we help you and how, how can our oversight process help you meet the goals that are, if they're reasonable goals, of getting there so that we do do it on that way and, and that's what we'll strive for. We're all set. Thank you all very, very much. I'm sorry that it went so late because of the votes and things of that nature, but you've been extremely helpful, and I suspect we may be getting back to take advantage of your expertise sometime in the future as well. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.